Hey everyone, welcome to the Speed Secrets Podcast. Uh, this I know I said that I was going to take a break from recording podcasts for a little while, and, but I also said that I was going to record a few special episodes here and there, and this is a special episode. You see me doing this in air quotes, special. Um, this is a special episode because we want to introduce the Sim Racer Academy, the Speed Secrets Sim Racer Academy, and just talk a little bit about that. And I'm talking here with the team, the team of us that have put this thing together. And we're pretty excited and pumped up about uh, having launched it just recently. Um, it's uh, It's been a ton of work over the last, well, year or so. But uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a ton of work to get it going. And even if you're not a sim racer, we're going to talk about some things that will apply to non-sim racing. Uh, and maybe even some things sort of outside of motorsport even, just some stuff around teamwork and things like that. So we're going to have some fun with this uh, podcast, and we're going to have a conversation amongst the four of us. And uh, uh, I, I'll, I'll introduce the team here in no particular order, but um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Ron. Ron Gale, who is my oldest friend, and I, I hate saying that because it makes it sound like Ron's really old, but he's not. He's just the friend that I've had the longest. And uh, uh, in fact, Ron, uh, I think it's got to be like 45 something years ago, you came with me or you were with me at my first day at the racetrack at Westwood Motorsport Park outside of Vancouver. Um, and you've been a part of my racing my entire career, so my entire life. So um, that's been really cool. We've been involved in motorsport for a long, long time together. Uh, and you got heavily involved in sim racing a few years ago, and that's helped motivate me with this whole Sim Racer Academy. In fact, I'm going to tell something right now, and then I'll move on here. But uh, um, something you said to me last winter really gave me the big push, the final push to really get this thing going. I'd been thinking about it for a while, and I'd been suggesting to you you know, practice this technique. And I remember you calling me or texting me or something. And you said, I just spent 20 minutes practicing. I think it was in a skippy car at Monza and exactly what you told me to do. And you just knocked one and a half seconds off your best lap time. And I'm like, yeah, that's what this thing has got to be meant to do. So um, I'll, I'll let you, <laughs> I'll let you talk in a minute here, Ron, but uh, um Anchor Bergson, Anchor, um, you and I started emailing each other, I don't know, a couple, two, three years ago, I can't remember, and about driving on the track and car club stuff because of the involvement you have with Porsche Club and uh, HPDE stuff and then sim racing stuff and back and forth specifically about sim racing. And again, it was that motivation coming from somebody that's going, you need to apply this stuff to sim racing as well. That gave me a big kick in the butt as well. Um, and I, and I'll let you sort of give more detail, but I think you kind of, you came from track stuff and you got into sim racing and now you're pretty heavily involved in sim racing. Um, so that's a, an interesting background, you know, Ron coming from a heavy racing background and then got into sim racing. You came from, sort of track day stuff and into sim racing. And then Connor, Connor Murphy, um, Connor, you and I connected a few years ago and I came over to your place and watched you on your sim because you were a heavy sim racer and came from a gaming background and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, uh, and but you wanted to take the sim racing stuff and take it to the track, sort of the other way around. And we did some stuff back and forth and you're now racing in endurance racing in, in the real world. I hate that term um, because it makes it makes sim racing sound not real. And it is very, very real. But um, uh, so we've kind of got this mix on this team. And I think that's what makes this thing so fantastic. So, wow, I've talked a lot, way more than I usually do on a podcast. So, guys, um, how about you guys talk a little bit about your background and, you know, Give a little bit a bit more insight into what sim racing means to you and how it relates to real world as well. So um, let me flip this around and Connor, why don't you start? Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Ross. Um, you know, I 
always grew up liking cars, but didn't grow up in a racing uh, family. And um, I never really had the opportunity to um, get to the track ever. Uh, and so I never really knew much about motorsport, never watched it growing up. Um, my love for motorsport really came when I got the job uh, as a QA lead at um, Turn 10 Studios uh, on the Forza Motorsports games. Um, it was my first job out of college. And um, I was surrounded by motorsports nuts and car people, people that were that knew a lot more than me and just took my passion and, and, uh, you know, grew it. And so I, I really got a great education in software development cycles and gaming and how they were thinking about track development, tire models, you know, this is early days of like laser scanning, tire testing, um, looking at like theoretical math models versus how things work in the real world and where those things don't match up and, and how those assumptions work. And so it was really amazing. And um, I told myself that if I ever had any money, I would try to uh, track cars in real life and maybe even race at some point. Um, I didn't know when that would ever happen. But um, basically, I started training with simulators when they started getting good uh, with the force feedback wheels and pedals. And I had this vision that I could take what I was the, the uh, muscle memory that I was learning um, and translate it to the real world. And I, I kind of had this delusion or dream that I could show up and just um, knock everyone's socks off <laughs> with right out of the box. That was my to, to practice so much and get so good that the minute that I sat into a real car, I would just. I would be ready to go. Um, and how did and that go? <laughs> it would, it didn't exactly go like that, but I will say that it, uh, with your help, because I was doing a lot of things wrong in the simulator. And so I was practicing incorrectly, but uh, before I actually did get into the real car, I spent about a year practicing correctly with some of your help. And, um, and the results were pretty, pretty amazing when I got into the real car. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't exactly like I had planned in my head. There's still things that were missing in terms of like the feel and the seat and pants that I'm still working on. But um, in terms of being pretty quick right out of the box, um, I, I definitely uh, was happy with the results. And now you're racing in uh, like Lucky Dog Endurance Racing Series, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I kind of, you, you introduced me to uh, someone else who had similar goals in the area and we'd become really good friends and he was racing, um, in endurance racing and we ended up, um, he ended up introducing me to his team. Uh, we've had, uh, a lot of fun and a lot of success kind of battling from the mid pack up to up through the ranks onto the podium. And, um, this last year we've had a lot of success and it's just been really fun. Like you said, with working with the team. Um, to kind of build our car into something that's um, competitive every week. Yeah, what uh, what I enjoy is after a weekend, I get a text message or an email from you with you holding a trophy, which is a photo of you holding a trophy. That, that's, that's pretty fun. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I've certainly seen people who have used sim racing and sim uh, simulator training uh, who have just sped up that process and been able to get into cars and uh, onto the real track. And, you know, you know, are they world champions immediately? No, there, there are things that are slightly different and some things that need to be adapted to, but uh, um, you've uh, certainly sped up that process. So it's been really interesting to see uh, your progress and progress makes it sound like you were like you sucked at one period of time and now you're really good. Um, but no, I'd say you were really good and you became really gooder. Um, there's a new word for you. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing how, how far it can get you. And um, in, you know, there are people that are still, still skeptical that I meet that, that don't think that that's the reason why I'm fast, but I, I can confidently say that, um, it without simulation, there is no way that I would be able to do get to where I got to 
um, so quickly. It, it just wouldn't be possible. Well, maybe we'll come back and we'll talk a little, talk a little bit about sort of the racecraft part of that. But um, uh, Anchor, how about uh, kind of filling in the gaps on my quick brief intro of you? So, hey, um, My introduction to motorsports uh, happened around 1959, wow. which kind of, uh, uh, places me in a... The age group that most of you are out in, um, when I worked at a race track, and my job was to carry around a an advertising sign, which I had to put down when the races actually ran. So I get got to watch the races, and I got paid for it, which was fantastic. Wow! And I loved that, and really wanted to get involved more with it and be in a race car myself. But then my family moved to Tanzania, where there wasn't a lot of motorsports going on, but where you had a lot of uh, slick, bumpy, sandy roads, which uh, really gave me a good introduction to, to car control. And then we have to go, I'm afraid, 60 years up in time when uh, I bought my first Porsche Boxster and joined PCA and got involved with autocross. And I got involved with track days, DEs as they call them in PCA. I don't know whether that's a universal term. And that's when I started emailing back and forth with Ross because a good friend of mine uh, introduced me to the Speed Secrets emails that I subscribed to and really love. And I learned a lot from them, but I also had an opportunity to discuss the learning process, which is a lifelong fascination of mine. You know, how do people learn and how do, do they learn efficiently? And uh, I got hooked on, uh, on model sports, thankfully, and... We bought another box, and then I bought the Caterham that you mentioned earlier. And now I've been doing that for about six years. But two years ago, I bought a very, very simple sim racing rig. And the purpose was to give me more wheel and uh, pedal time uh, so that I could become better at autocross primarily. And I just loved sim racing, and I've been hooked on it ever since then. And now I'm at the stage where I pretty much uh, get on the rig every single day. I have a couple of serious races every week, and I practice in between. And um, having the opportunity to work with this team it was just fantastic. And I really look forward to what we can accomplish and what we can share with everybody else. Yeah, that's the fun part of, well, it's certainly what drives me is the, the fun part is, is sharing what I've learned, what we've learned with, uh, with other people. So it's, um, I know there are certain people and that uh, may come back to that in terms of the sort of the teamwork piece and, how yeah. motorsport works and everything, but you know. May yeah. I say one more thing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, something that I believe that I bring to the table is the relative newness of my experience. Ah. That is my struggles to learn, the, you know, aha moments that I had, and all of that I feel I, I can share so that I can help. Others who are also new to the sport avoid having go through the struggles that I've had. That's super interesting, and and, and as I sit here and uh, I hope I hope um, you take this the right way, but <laughs> you are I think the oldest one of the, of the four yes. of us, or five of us, or four of us, and um, uh, you know Connor, you're the youngest. Um, 
Ron and I fit squarely in the middle, right, Ron? Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, again, take this the right way, Anchor, but, you know, there's the whole thing of you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, I've, I've been a great believer that that is totally wrong. And I think exactly. you're a great example of somebody that's taken up sim racing and even track driving relatively late in life. And, and, and yet, I mean, uh, I just happened to notice that you're on the podium of a recent PCA sim race, which is super, super competitive. I watched the event and, and uh, you know, you're very, very, very fast and good. So um, I think you're proven that uh, old dogs can still learn a lot. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Ron, um, I, I, you know, Anchor mentioned he is a Caterham, which is essentially a Lotus. And, you know, Connor has a Lotus Elise. And if anybody has been following what I've been doing, I got a Lotus and a 69 Lotus Elan this year. So, um, Ron, you're going to have to get a Lotus to join the, you know, the club here, the, the Sim Racer Academy slash Lotus Club. Um, it's pretty exclusive right now. It's three people. So. Yeah, I've been uh, scanning the uh, used ads right, right now. So Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Ron, uh, a little bit more of your background in, in, in how um, uh, you've kind of gone from the whole motorsport fanatic to sim racing, total total uh, sim racer nerd here. So, <laughs> Well, thanks very much, Ross. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, so I think it was about 1976, maybe. Not that I'm trying to date us, but um, that was when I think I first met you. Well, sort of. I knew yeah, you a little yeah. bit in high school, but not too much. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I just was always been interested in cars, and uh, it was a good way for me to get involved uh, um, initially without spending too much money. Um, let that uh, fall into my ultra shoulders. So um, I, I helped you for a number of years through. A, different uh, classes and uh, I've always had a, a fun time, a great way of being involved in motorsport. Um, and uh, when uh, our local track closed um, at Westwood, uh, kind of left a hole in the motorsports world here in, in uh, Vancouver area. Um, it was filled with a, a track, uh, another track a few years later, but that's kind of what uh, my motivation was to get into sim racing because uh, kind of fulfilled my racing junkie habit. Um, started off with an Apple II, I think, and the, the games are like uh, incredibly uh, uh, simple back in those days. It wasn't until about uh, three years ago that um, I came across iRacing. I was always a, just a computer racer, but not a uh, sim racer, I'd like to say, because um, I was just racing against a computer all those years. But in 2019, I came across iRacing, and then uh, I fell in love with the competition side of it. So I always thought I was a pretty good driver until I got on iRacing and knew that I had to start learning. So um, uh, with a lot of your help, um, I have become a decent sim racer. Uh, I've become the captain or the the owner of uh, a league in iRacing, a Canadian Racing League. Um, have about 135 members. We hold uh, usually three uh, races a week, uh, three nights a week, different cars, so that we can have a little bit of fun and all sorts of stuff, open wheel, sedans. Right now we're racing the Porsche Cup. So, um, yeah, so uh, that's where my involvement got. And... Um, as we all know, if you're on iRacing or one of these services, there's always somebody better than you are. So there's always uh, always room for improvement. Yeah, I, Ron, I, I can remember um, being at your place and with your Apple II, and I think you had Flight Simulator first, was your first simulator <laughs> thing, wasn't it? Yeah. I think so, yeah. 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 There were a lot of plane crashes, I think, at first. I so. think so, yeah. <laughs> a little bit more expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so, so I think, you know, this is, um, you know, a part of launching Sim Racer Academy. And I, I guess at some point we should just explain what Sim Racer Academy is. If you're listening to the podcast, you've not seen it yet. Um, you can go to simraceracademy.com. Essentially, it is a resource to help you improve, uh, being a sim racer, to be a better sim racer, uh, sooner, faster, more effectively, more efficiently, whatever. And I think, 
you know, just listening to you guys talk about your backgrounds. I mean, there's a common theme here, I think, in in that you guys all want to learn and get better. And, you know, Ron, you talk about how there's always somebody better than you, right? And um, maybe that applies to, I mean, I, I, I'm, no, that I know for sure. It applies to, again, real world. Maybe just clarify that. I hate the term real world versus sim racing. Uh, some of the best, most competitive, tough racing I've seen has been <laughs> sim racing. But uh, the, the term is real world versus sim racing, I guess. Um, uh, you know, I think in Formula One this year, you, Lewis Hamilton's going, wow, there's somebody that's maybe better than me at times. So, yeah. um, you, you know, here's a seven time world champion that's that's having to think about that for the first time in a few years, I think. So um, or for maybe maybe for a long time ever, maybe even for him. Uh, uh, so I think that that's an interesting thing. And so the Sim Racer Academy is designed to be a resource to help people learn more in less time, essentially. And um, my my approach to coaching and driver development, driver training is uh, I, I follow the, you know, teach a man to fish and never go hungry again approach. You know, there's a lot of there. There are there are ways where I could just get on a sim rig or in real life at a real track and just say, okay, just follow me or just follow my data or just watch me. And that's some kind of short term learning. And it doesn't make somebody faster. Yes, it does right then and there. But a lot of times the person doesn't understand the driver doesn't understand why they're faster. And I anchor that's something that you've touched on a lot of times is understanding the why behind it and it's something that I've, I've been is really big to me. Um, so the Sim Racer Academy is around providing the background knowledge of why uh, you should do what you do and then giving you the tools to help you practice those things and and work with those specific techniques. So um, that's the idea. It's a huge library of content. It will be updated every week. Um, there's always going to be more and it's uh, it's our team here that's putting all this stuff together. So that's the quick background. What have I missed, guys? I can't think of anything. <laughs> okay. I, 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 wow, I covered it all. Um, actually, well, no, I, I thought about something. Um, and, and Connor, especially, you have been providing some really good, I guess, product review information. Like, uh, you know, just this morning, I was answering a couple of emails from people saying, you know, where do I find information about what equipment I should buy? And and you, you've uh, provided a lot of information there. And I know well that that catalog of information will will continually be updated because the one thing about sim racing equipment that I've seen is it is constantly it's constantly changing. You know, the wheels, the pedals, the chassis, the uh, everything. Um, it's 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 changing so rapidly so you've been adding a lot of that kind of content and that's um that's that's been a big part of it so yeah it's amazing how many manufacturers have kind of jumped in and i think it's just going to continue to grow so we'll try to make sure that we're always um covering the new stuff that comes out and kind of what it's bringing to the table um but yeah, what's great about sim racing is that you can be quick on on anything, and really, it's about optimizing what you have. And you know, a lot of the fastest people in sim racing have the simplest equipment. Yeah, and really, like the it depends on what your goal is, um, whether it's uh, shaving time on a certain uh, like track car combo. Um, or whether you're trying to set uh, your wheel and pedals and everything up to to maybe fit, to match a real world car, um, there's something you know. There's ways to do that um, and optimize what you have. Or if you're looking to upgrade, you might be looking what's the best bang for the buck. What's the what can get me closest to what I'm looking for for the cheapest amount of money? And you know the stuff is obviously expensive, so it's the uh, the old adage of like buy once, cry once always applies because I've gone through a lot of, um, a lot of equipment that wasn't exactly what I thought. Um, 
but um, it's all good in terms of just going, you know, if you just want to go out and race, almost everything you, you get these days um, can help you accomplish that goal and you can have amazing fun with it. Well, some, something that I've noticed is it, it, sim racing, the sim racing world is no different than the r- real track world um, in that there is a different reason. Everybody has a different reason for doing it. And, you know, like you go to the track and there are some people who yeah, they want to improve their driving a little bit. But what they really, really want to do is they want to tinker with their car. They want to, you know, change the brakes. They want to change the tires and wheels. They want to upgrade the motor. I mean, they want that's why they're doing it. They're into that part of it. And I see people in the same racing world who, you, you know, they get their thrill out of this new steering wheel or this new button on the on the on the on the dash, you know, or whatever. Right. So they want to. They're, they're constantly tweaking their sim rig. And then there are other people that, I mean, I know a couple of like world champion class level uh, sim racers and you look at what they're using and it's almost the, you know, they're uh, a simple little steering wheel strapped to a desk and they're sitting in a, in a, in a chair, you know, like they're, they're, they've got the most simple basic setups and yet they just work them really hard and, and the right way. So I think that's really interesting. And, and again, parallels between the real world and the simulated world, I guess. And one thing we've talked about, Ross, is how when you hop into different cars, it's actually driving to, to that car. It teaches you something. And I would say sim equipment is similar in that when you actually can drive to the feel of that equipment and maximize that equipment, and it's just like getting into a different car. So it, it all has value. So uh, have you guys had experience of recently, I guess, is you're driving your sim and then you go to somebody else's sim and you get into it and it takes you a while to get used to it or you picked it up pretty quickly. Have you had that experience? Absolutely. Um, I actually have two rigs, uh, the one I use personally and one that I use as a loaner rig. Ah. to get others hooked on it. And I also have friends who have rigs. And I would say the big difference, interesting enough, is the pedals. Yeah. That you, you have to get used to pedals and how they feel and how to modulate them to drive well. And if you jump in a rig with pedals that you've never tried before, it takes a while. Yeah. And and I think uh, you know if if you've listened to this podcast before you you know you maybe heard me talk about I do uh, I I use simulator for coaching and particularly have one coaching client that uh, I spend a lot of time coaching remotely where you know he's in his simulator uh, in one part of the world country and I'm in another part and I have a screen where I see what he sees I also have live telemetry showing me brake and throttle and steering trace while he's driving. Um, and I have cameras set up, so it's pointing at his feet and over his shoulder, so I'm looking at his hand. So I can, in real time, be talking to him about driving technique and working on stuff remotely, and it's hugely valuable. But we also have his co-drivers from his race car, because um, he races an IMSA, uh, his co-drivers come and get on his sim rig at times. And you know, these are, again, highly, they're, they're world-class, elite-level professional race drivers, and they have their sim rigs at home. And the first time they get on to this other sim rig, there's a little bit of a learning process. There's a little bit of that time. Now, because they're pros, and that's their job, and they've been switching around in cars all their life, they're pretty quick at it. But um, I, I think you bring up really good, both, both of you bring up a really good point of that the more adaptable you become uh, to those things, the uh, I, I think that's a, 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 a valuable learning process or learning tool. And there's, there's a couple things um, where there's this, the hardware side of it. So the actual physical feel of the pedals that Anchor's talking about. And then there's actually the software side of it, which is just as important, which is, where is the software reading that you're at hundred percent break and, and how, you know, where are the tires locking up? How much pressure do you have to put into the pedal to get to that hundred percent lock? Um, 
similarly with different wheels sometimes the steering number the rotation on the wheel is different in different sim rigs so how many turns to lock the steering is one place where sometimes the that's where uh it gets a little bit different you have to turn the wheel more on one sim rig versus another to get the car to turn mm. Good point. So, so Connor, I know you've been building some rigs, some sim rigs for some people. And I know, so that means you're putting them together and you're kind of doing that calibration piece and getting them set up. And sounds like anchor, you're a, you're a drug dealer. I mean, a, a sim racing <laughs> dealer here, uh, uh, getting people. So you've probably done some of that. R Ron, I'm kind of curious, like, cause you've been using that sim rig and you keep upgrading it and doing some stuff to it, but how much tuning do you do of that stuff? Like, do you find that switching from a, you know, Porsche GT car to a Skip Barber car to a Indy car or whatever, when you're racing these different races, do you play with that stuff or you kind of go, that's my setup, I'm sticking to it? Oh, no. Uh, each car has got its own setup. Yeah. So, um, as Connor knows, you know, the newer direct drive wheels, uh, you can set parameters, uh, force feedback, um, you know, all the different parameters for each car. So, um, yeah, every car, every race, I, I load a, a setup for that car. So it, it um, like, for example, the, the Porsche Cup car, it's got quite a bit of heavier steering. So uh, you notice that right away. And, and how much of that is driver preference and how much of that is just, um, hey, somebody told me to put this in. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I would relate to that. It's probably a little bit more realistic. Having never driven a Porsche Cup car, I don't know what it's like, but um, it seems to fit the situation. So I, I think it is quite important to not just have a one-size-fits-all type of approach. And it, especially, Ross, with degrees of rotation, you know, a Formula One car might have like 260 degrees uh, for steering wheel rotation which is very, very low versus a GT, like a DTM car, maybe it's like 540 degrees. Mm -hmm. So if you, um, you have to tune that, that is not really subjective and it requires research to figure those, those little details out. So changing gears just slightly here in, for people who are listening to this, who are not sim racers and uh, I'm going to say particularly people who have driven on a track a lot, they've either raced or done a lot of track driving and they get on a sim and they go, this sucks. This has, you know, this has nothing to do with real life. Uh, you know, I can drive a car around a track, but I can't, I can't do a lap on a simulator. How do you guys respond to that? Okay, I'll jump in. Um, there's some truth to it. There's a learning curve. And the big difference is the stimuli that you get. Um, in a real race car, you get, get a lot of G-forces um, and a lot of, you, you feel rotation, you feel nose dive, you feel um, a lot of things where in sim racing, because your, your rig is sitting still, and at best, it'll tilt a little bit this way and that way or give you a little bit of rumble. You're really dependent on using different st stimuli to tell you what the car is doing. So the big one that I use and most sim racers use is listening. So you turn up the tire noise and you use tire noise to tell you whether whether you're close to the limit. And that takes some getting used to. Um, and, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the environment you're in also can be more or less immersive. Um, I use a virtual reality, which means that I can turn my head in, up and down and in any direction. And I can see everything as if I was sitting in a real car. Um, if you just use monitors, it's different, and uh, there will usually be some level of distortion of what you see. So, again, um, you have to get used to it, 
But once you get used to it, it's easily transferable. You know, I can go out on the track and I can use the G-forces to understand. And the, the butt feel when my rear gets loose to control the car, and then I can go right back to the simulator and use the different stimuli. It is simply a learning process in my view. Yeah. One thing I've noticed when people first get on Sims is that the sense of speed is off for them in many cases. So what they'll do is they'll drive 120 miles an hour into a corner and then they're late on the brakes. And it's because the maybe a hundred miles an hour doesn't feel what a hundred miles an hour feels like in a real car where it's actually quite, you can, it's quite scary maybe to come late into a brake zone at a hundred miles an hour in a real car. Um, and, and sometimes the simulator doesn't convey that sense of speed. And so what they end up doing is watching their, um, their mile per hour reading. And so they're constantly looking up and down to see how fast they're going. And, you know, um, I think that finding the braking markers is one way to figure that out, but also just training your eyes. What does 60 miles an hour feel like in this particular simulator, in this particular car, in this situation? Um, and it kind of reminds me, you, this is even in the real world, Ross. I remember you telling me, I was saying, I don't know exactly how fast I'm going. And you said you have to learn without looking at the speedometer, looking down, what is 60 miles an hour actually feel like and getting really tuned into that. What is a hundred miles an hour? Just with the eyes. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's that, that's really important too. And and the other thing that's kind of what you touched on there is uh, I've been in a position on a real world track where somebody's getting into a car for the very first time and they go out on the track and I watch how they get up to speed. And the very first time they approach term one, they don't approach it at 100 miles an hour. And yet, if they're in a simulator, they will. And I think some of it is the speed sensing thing, but there's also something in a real car, you go, if I crash, this is gonna hurt. (laughs) In a sim, they immediately just turn that part of the brain off and go, I can go into this corner 100 miles an hour because that's what I do in a real car. And they don't have that lack of fear. And, and, and then they immediately spin off and immediately throw it out and say, okay, this doesn't work. So, um, uh, I, I think it's kind of a combination of all those things, a lack of feel, lack of speed sensing, a lack of fear. Um, and then, um, I, without, um, I, I don't, I gotta be careful in saying this because I don't want somebody to feel insulted by this. So please, if you feel insulted by this, I don't mean that. But sometimes our egos get in there. And if I spin off the track on a simulator, it's easier to blame the simulator than it is me. So I think there's a little bit of that there. So also it's kind of like with a simulator, you always have people watching. <laughs> so it's like, you know, you're teeing off on the on the first 18 in front of the you know uh clubhouse and everyone's watching you and it makes it harder i think in some ways when your friends are watching yeah yeah and connor um i wanted to kind of go back to the thing around racecraft and you know part of what you learn uh your racecraft going into endurance this endurance racing where there's tons of cars on track and you're constantly passing and being passed how did sim racing prepare you for that I mean, I think it's been one of the most valuable things that sim racing can do. If, you know, when you go through the, the gauntlet of iRacing, especially the rookies, and you see all the crazy stuff people are pulling and you're trying to increase your your safety rating and make sure you get through these sessions without contacts, without offs, um, it just makes you really sensitive to understand the attitude of the cars around you and the mental map of the whole picture of what's going on. And a lot of people, even in real racing, aren't as sensitive as maybe someone that's gone through so many sim races where they can see this guy's going to go off. And so, or one thing I notice people do that's, um, I would say a problem is that when they actually see a car start to slide, when they see smoke, even when they see a crash, they will, put the pedal down hundred percent. Like, here's my chance. 
<laughs> in a bunch of places. Um, and, uh, and, you know, if you go through enough races in, in the simulator, you'll know that the best way to navigate the situations is not to try to gain as many positions as possible because on net you will lose more often than you will win. But the temptation to kind of pull the drive through the smoke, can't see anything, but we're going, you know, we're going high, we're going hundred percent. That, that temptation is very real. Um, but I would say that, yeah, navigating traffic in terms of, um, what a simulator can give you navigating traffic and passing is something that I feel like personally, I am at a higher level than even my raw pace. So my, my one lap speed is, is good relative to my teammates in the field, but it's not like, I'm not just, I'm not just like on another level with my lap times, but it's the ability to get around traffic in a safe and predictable way that makes my team um, makes them trust me with the car that I'm going to bring it home, that I'm not going to break it, that I'm uh, that I always have margin on hand. Um, I'm, I'm actually not driving 110%. I'm driving, you know, I'm driving to the limit, but not going over the limit and not having the offs, not having any contacts. And that uh, builds confidence over time for sure. Well, one of the things you talked about there is, you know, through experience, we learn to read situations better. And, you know, it's, 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 it's pattern matching. And if you've had that experience of, let's say, driving down a road, a highway, and just, you know, out of the corner of your eye, you see something at an intersection and you slow down and a car blows through a stop sign or a traffic light or something like that. And, and somebody else might go, how did you know? How did you know that was going to happen? And it's pattern matching. And whereas a sixteen-year-old who's just got their driver's license may not have that experience to be able to pattern match that. More, the more we race, the more scenarios you're put through, the more you build that that database of, of patterns. And I think that's one of the greatest things that sim racing does for you. Um, mm -hmm. So it's hugely valuable. I think the other thing just really quick is I think sim racing gives you uh, mental toughness hmm. where, um, you know, there's a lot of races when you end up racing against people that are matched in your skill level where you have to be very mentally tough because you're not just blowing by them and they're not blowing by you. And you might have to follow a car lap after lap after lap and not be, maybe you're gaining in some corners, but you're losing in other corners. And that is a grind. That is a mental hurdle that you actually have to overcome. It's very discouraging not to get a payoff, but it's very satisfying when you go through that grind and then you put pressure on the person that you're following. And then they end up having an off or they end up making a mistake and you pass them. And that's like the ultimate satisfaction. But I'd say that that uh, what I talk about with, uh, the guys, I, one of the guys I co-drive with John Kim, an amazing driver, he talks about it as cultivating a bulldog mentality. So his idea is that when he sinks his teeth in, he's not letting go. <laughs> I like that. It's, yeah. easy, it's easy to let go because, um, mentally you either want to pass them or you want to give up and let them go. That's kind of your default mode as a human being. And so to be that bulldog of like, no matter what, I'm not letting him go. It doesn't matter if he's better than me. I'm going to become better right now. I'm going to become better in this moment. And, you know, John was once racing with, uh, Randy props, um, who's obviously a really, really fast driver in our series. And he kind of had, he refused to let Randy just drive away. <laughs> and so he ended up having one of the best sessions of his life because he was he was like no this is not going to happen I, right here right now i'm going to raise my level and i'm going to stick with him and they ended up passing each other and being passed and passing through the whole field these two cars for two hours long and that's the bulldog mentality that whole mindset piece is i think is critical and 
And uh, I actually just watched uh, anchor one of your PCA um, races that you were not able to to uh, participate in. Um, and uh, a friend of mine won it, and it was just he bulldog ran second place right to the very end, and the guy in front made a mistake towards the end, and and he ended up winning. And you know he he obviously was fast and he was really good, but he never made a mistake, and it was just. Yeah, every single lap just kept pushing, 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 keeping the pressure on. And eventually he won that. And Ron, I know you shared some experiences of that same kind of thing where you just you got to keep pushing. Yep. Man, I've been on both sides of that coin, too. I've been the guy that's made the mistake. And uh, I've had a number of those races where, like Connor was saying, you're just sitting there waiting for the other person to make that one mistake so you can capitalize. And I'm going to say that. It seems to me, it, I, my experience is sim racing is harder. Yeah. It, it, it's harder than in real life racing. And, and maybe it's just my comfort level with, because I've done a whole lot more real life racing than I have on in sim racing. And, it, and it's just, it's, it's um, uh, I, I don't know why that is. But the key to that is if you practice it on a sim, you're going to be that much better in real world if, if that's your goal. And, and there's a lot of people who, well, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that worldwide there are more sim racers than there are real world racers. Like, oh, I would think so. Yeah. So, so um, to kind of get towards the end here, we're getting close to on our time here. And I always like to try to keep this uh, to a reasonable amount of time, these podcasts, but um What's your favorite part of the Sim Racer Academy that we've created? I go first. <laughs> um, I I really I mean, there's two sections I love. Um, one is tuning a car setup. I haven't immersed myself in that as much as I should, and understanding the way a car works better. Um, so, like, I'm trying to learn tires. Uh, roll stiffness, suspension geometry, balance, becoming more sensitive to oversteer and understeer to know what the car is doing. Is it oversteering too much? Is it understeering too much? How does it change versus each corner? Um, and then making notes and being able to come back and say after the session, like what was happening inside the car? Because I have a tendency to just drive the car, whatever it's doing, I just drive to whatever the car is giving me. And then I don't know Maybe I'll know understeer, but it's hard for me to say oversteer um, with a car. Um, and then the second section is racecraft. I mean, I just think it's such a such a good section, um, and it's all really a, a mental thing. And um, I'm always trying to develop a, an attacking car energy. I'm trying to mentally project an attitude in my car that I'm coming through, and you just need to get out of the way. And I want to, tr- it's not like a false bravado or making people feel unsafe. Like I'm taking risks. I just want them to feel mentally that there's no point in fighting it. Uh-huh. <laughs> it just, it's better to just, you know, let me buy. And especially in like a multi-race series, if you cultivate that feeling over many, many races, that every time I come into their rear view mirrors, it's going to just be a quick pass. I, I actually um, can make those passes easier and easier over time. Yeah. So um, th- those are the two areas I'm, uh, I think are amazing and, and I'm always working on improving myself. So the, the, the tuning, the setup piece, that, that was one of the big things that, you know, we talked about as a team in terms of content and stuff. And, you know, there, there are uh, other fantastic resources that I highly, highly recommend that people use to, if you just want to bolt on somebody's setup on your car, go do that. That's fantastic. But if you want to understand the why, and that's the piece, Anchor, you keep coming back to as well, as well is, is the why. You want to understand why does that setup work? Or, Ron, you've, you've, you've uh, mentioned to me that, you know, you've bolted on some setups from other people, and they haven't quite been exactly what you wanted. But the key is understand, well, why, why didn't that work? You know, if it worked for somebody else, why didn't it work for me? So that's been, you know, that's part of the educational piece that I've wanted in Sim Racer Academy to, to help people understand why this setup either works or doesn't work. And then if it doesn't work, what can you do about it? So 
that's uh, that's really really important. So, Ron, what's your favorite piece? Well, um, I'm going to be much like Connor. Uh, one of the big things is the setup um, section. I, yeah. I'm not very good at setting up a car. I know very little about it, and I just have never taken the time to understand it. So, here's my opportunity. Well, Ron, you've only been in the sport for 50 years or so. Yeah, Come on. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Give yourself a break. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I was talking to one of our members this morning, and um, he signed up for SRA already. And uh, he's very big on dampers. He thinks that that's the, the end all, the be all. Uh-huh. And he went in and he read the article about dampers. Now, he's got a lot of your material already. But he said the article you read in SRA, it just resonated with him how you explained it. And he went and revisited his setup just for uh, you know one, one track, one car that uh, we're about to race. And he applied some of that logic to it. And he was already one second faster in the first five minutes. <laughs> only a second? And, yeah, only a second. Oh, wow. So, we got to do better than that. <laughs> Uh, so that's my long story to say I'm in trouble. I, I've got to jump on the SRA right away and start doing my thing. Um, the other thing I like is, um, again, the racecraft. Um, it's something I am have gotten quite a bit better at, but uh, my many years of just racing against computer has not served me well when I'm racing against other people. So... Um, well, computers are fairly predictable. People are not. <laughs> well, let me ask the question. Uh, in terms of racecraft, is it technique or is it the mental part of racecraft? I kind of think that it's a bit of technique. Um, I'm not good at setting somebody up for a pass. So uh, unlike Connor, who you know is going to let the person know that uh, he's coming through, I tend to sit behind somebody too long, even though I know I'm faster. Well, Ron, I just say that's the Canadian and you coming out. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're, we're just so nice. That's right. Sorry, yeah. you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you and know that I've learned how to how to adapt that piece. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the third thing is the member spotlight. Oh, okay. Hey, guess what? Guess who's the member spotlight right now? You. You get to, yeah. you get to start off. So yeah. Thank you very much. Actually, and you know, that's going to be a fun piece uh, going uh, forward is just the community piece and um, just the sharing. And, and Anchor, you've really been uh, helping with the Discord side of uh, the Sim Racer Academy and really encouraging the communication. We're just kind of getting, really kind of getting that piece going, but uh, that's a huge, huge part of it. So I'm I'm excited to see where that goes. So, Anchor, what's your favorite part or parts? Because well, you guys are not able to, to narrow it down to one. But uh, yeah, well, uh, in terms of personal development, I'm with Connor and Ron that the race craft and the setup is where I'm looking for the most useful data for me at, right at this time. But um, the uh, the Discord server is a huge part of what I think is value that's the, uh, that you bring to the table because it allows the com- it creates a community. Yeah, and I'm really looking forward to learn new people, uh, get to know them, um, help newcomers learn from the really experienced people, and also have a lot of fun together. Yeah. And yeah, no, that that's huge. And, you know, we we as a team talked about that in the very beginning, just uh, how important that community piece is and how we um, uh, we can all learn from each other. It doesn't matter whether somebody has just started sim rig, it's their first day on, on a sim rig or they've been doing it for years. Um, we can all learn from each other. In fact, I know personally, maybe I'm, I've had this experience more in the real world, but where maybe it's a car that I've been driving for years and years and years and at a track I've been at for years and years and somebody brand new comes along and says, well, I'm doing this. And I go, huh, I'm going to go try that. And it works. So um, if you're new to this stuff, don't be afraid to share because uh, 
often we can learn from you. So, so can I share my my favorites? Absolutely. Yes. So, to me, the the part that I'm most excited about, and, and unfortunately, this requires a little bit of work. I, I'm doing an air quotes here. Uh, is the practice program, and because the the single biggest uh, tool approach, whatever you want to call it, that has helped me be a better coach, helped me be a successful coach, is giving people the right practice strategies, the right ways to learn. And um, so, you know, the Sim Racer Academy has an area that's going to have, it has a number of drills and we'll just I'll keep adding more and more drills. And they're really simple. You know, they might take five minutes, they might take 30 minutes, but it's just a way of, of practicing that is more deliberate, it's more strategic, and it's, and it's um, you know, I use this analogy all the time that uh, if football teams practiced the way race drivers practice, they would just show up and they show up at a practice and they play a game. But they don't do that. They break the game down into specific techniques and drills and they do blocking drills and they do passing drills and they do running drills. And then every once in a while, they put that together in a scrimmage. And then every now and then they play a game. Well, the more you can do that, the better. And it is way easier to do these practice drills on a sim than it is in real life. And so rather than just practicing by, I'm going to go and drive around this entire track and learn the entire track all at one time, the idea is to break it down into little chunks. And it's just, I'm going to work on my braking. I'm going to work on my vision. I'm going to work on my exit. I'm going to work on sensing oversteer. I'm going to work on, and that part, um, I'm most excited by that. Although, like I said, my concern is it does take a little bit of work and it's going to take a little discipline from people to actually use it. You know, it's one thing to read it. Uh, it's another to go and use it. And I, I often end uh, the workshops and things that I do uh, by saying, hey, none of what I just talked about works. None of it works. It doesn't work unless you use it. And uh, that's that's the case for this as well, I think. So and, and, and because you guys went to a second one, I'm going to go to a second one as well. Um, and that would be the mental game part. No, 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 that'd be the part where I get to do the chalk talks. Um, so every month or so, and it will depend a little bit on my travel schedule around uh, coaching and stuff. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're going to do a, an online chalk talk thing. And Ron, you and I did it for your league uh, last year or whenever it was. I can't remember when that was. Um, but basically, it's just an online session where... We get all our members together and we ask questions and we talk about it. And sometimes I use my little whiteboard to diagram some stuff. Sometimes it's just uh, some conversation that leads to people learning. And it's one of those things where, you know, we might get on there and it's somebody's going to ask about, you know, if the car has got understeer when I get back to power exiting a corner, what do I do with the dampers, with the shock absorbers? Well, and I say, well, in my experience, you know, I might, add a little compression to the rears, or I might add a little bit of front rebound. Um, and people then go and try it. So I'm looking forward to those because they're free flowing, um, casual conversations. And uh, that's part of the community piece as well. So we get together every month or so and and have these things. It's going to be a blast doing that. Mm -hmm. That would be good. Yeah. So guys, uh, thank you. And most importantly, uh, I, I, I you know, I talked in the very beginning about the teamwork piece, and this has been a teamwork uh, deal from the from the beginning. And um, I can't thank you guys for your help uh, enough for for making this thing work. And uh, all the members are uh, um, excited about the team that we've got here because you all bring something a little bit different. And I think if you ask most people what makes up the best team, most people would agree that. You've got a group of people that bring different strengths and weaknesses to to something, and uh, I think that's what we've got here. So, appreciate that. So, with that, um, if you're interested, if you're listening and you're interested in the Sim Racer Academy, uh, the website just go to simraceracademy.com. Uh, follow us on social media. We're basically at Sim Racer Academy everywhere: at Facebook, 
Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, um, again, at Sim Racer Academy. So um, follow us there and uh, we'll have some updates as we go along. The idea with uh, social media at times, there'll be some, you know, just reminders uh, for new people to, to join in the community, but uh, also uh, we'll be putting some tips on there every now and then as well. So um, that's the idea. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the show. Uh, as uh, as always, uh, keep learning and having fun.